Hello. Hello, everybody at home. Hello. Everybody coming in. All right, a few more folks coming in the classroom. Thought you were all giving up on me because of the rain. Because the rain and it's almost it's almost break. I'm counting this as a break. Kind of a break. It's kind of it's our spring break this year, right? That's this is what we get. This is what we get. Spring break. All right. Is everybody in here? Who's everybody else? I'll give everybody a few minutes because usually I'm the one who's late. Oh, see, look, people are coming. Usually I'm the one who's here after one o'clock. What else we gotta do? Let me get all this together. Who's done after my class? I know Maddie's going home. You're done after this? You're like, yes, me too. Just have like a couple meetings. <laughs> Let me get this exciting break, right? All right, let everybody else hop in. Let's see who's coming. Get this up here. Let's see. What are we doing on here? All right, if you're at home, will you just like type in your name and everything so I make sure that I have you in my, in my attendance? Yeah, leave 10 minutes early to get to your next class. That's okay. Let's see if we can if we can end 10 minutes early. <laughs> no guarantees because I'm super excited about it. I know I'm always excited about our lessons, but I'm like extra excited today. So I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try not to keep us the whole entire time so that we can all have a second. Oh, thanks for typing your name. Yeah, super. Uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But I am, I'm too excited about it what we're gonna talk about today. It's not in your book at all, which makes it even more exciting for me. Um, all right, as people are still maybe wandering in, I'll just start with the business that we always start with, right? Um, so reminders, reminders about next, we know Friday, no classes yet. Not that that affects this class, but yay for the rest of us with Friday classes, yay. No Friday classes, um, Monday, no classes. Yay, Cura Personalis Day. Hopefully you are doing nothing. <laughs> doing nothing. If you guys have any suggestions for me for TV shows I can watch, that would be so super. Uh, I'm gonna, it's a lie. I have to make all my exams for my other classes. I'm not gonna watch Netflix and chill all day. Um, but you should, you totally should. You should, totally should because in this class we do not have our live session and we do not have a knowledge celebration due. Yay, right? Because normally we do our knowledge celebration quizzes on Monday. Uh, so none for the upcoming week. And then on Wednesday, um, I heard a lot of the, the professors are doing asynchronous work on Wednesday. So I didn't want to make you come in if you didn't have to. Um, so we I will just post the lecture like a normal, it'll be me. Maybe I'll even record my, myself on it. We'll see. Um, it'll be our next normal lecture. I know, Sammy, I did write down Dancing with the Birds before. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> I literally wrote it down. I was like, I got to come up with something to do with you guys. Uh, but that is not what the lecture will be about. Wednesday's lecture will be um, continuing our discussion on social behavior stuff. So it's actually still like part of chapter seven, if you're following along in the book and you want to catch up on some of your reading, you know, we're, we're sort of past chapter six now, which was all about the sex differences and seasonality and communication. And now we're getting into different aspects of social behavior and mate choice. So if you wanna follow along in the text, chapter seven is a good place to be. That's what Wednesday's lecture will be about too. Um, and then the following week, week 10, 
So what is that? April 12th on Monday, we will meet as normal. Like I normally would see you on a Monday. We'll we'll get together unless something crazy happens. Knock on wood. Hopefully nothing. You never know. It's 2021. But my current plan is we will meet as we usually do on Monday, which is April 12th. Um, and we'll have a quiz due then, which will be all the stuff since the last quiz. I'll remind you, of course. Of course, I'll, I'll send you an email and I'll post it in due well. But our plan is to meet that Monday. And then um, Wednesday is another day off, a cure personality. So it's a crazy couple weeks in terms of schedule. I'm sure you're all brighter than I am and you've got this, but I got, I got to keep writing it down for myself. So. Um, if you're confused, don't feel bad if you have to email me and double check. But next week, I won't see you. You can, I mean, I'm on Zoom. If you ever want to just like chat about something, we could hop on. But we won't meet in class. We won't meet live next week, week nine. Week 10, we'll meet on Monday. But then we will have off on Wednesday. Yeah, and then, and then it's the final push, right? The final, the final, some, I don't want to bring it up, but. For some of you, it's the last few weeks of college, huh? And I are like, nope, we don't want to talk about this. Uh, that's fine. Last few weeks of my first year here. So that is our plan. Any, any business we need to chat about before I get back into our discussion about, were we talking about species recognition? Anything else? No, we're feeling good. We got it. Anybody at home? Oh, thank you, Abby, Bryn and Abby right there. Great, perfect. Uh, anybody else who, who popped in late, do me a favor and type in the chat so that I have a record that you hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's talk about some stuff. Let's do that. Like I said, I'm super excited about today. I'm always super excited about everything. Thanks, Chris. I saw you. I saw you there. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, okay, so to remind me, us, what we were talking about last time, um, we talked about like how the first big social behavior we're going to talk about is mate choice, how we pick the proper mate as a species. And we started talking about how important it is for species to recognize conspecifics. You don't want to reproduce with another closely related species if the offspring, the hybrids, have some sort of reduced viability. So if you remember last time we talked all about that, the biological species concept, and we talked about different aspects of reproductive isolation. Um, and we were finishing up talking about the frogs. So I wanted to bring up the chorus frogs again, because we didn't really finish getting through all of this. So I wanted to explain this example a little more in depth because uh, Ryan and Wilzinski mentioned this in their text. But I don't, I don't think they really did it justice, right? I don't, I don't think they did it justice. I am so that, that science nerd that when I see it in the textbook, I'm like, I just want to, I'm going to go look up the real paper, right? The primary literature. I'm going to, that's where I got this graph from because I'm like, I'm going to just double check because I want to know more about how this study went. Um, so this is a, a different figure than what's in your book, but it shows the same sort of information. If you remember, we talked about on Monday, in this study, um, who's this by Moriarty, Moriarty Lemon, she and her colleagues are studying these two different closely related species of chorus frogs, right? Names that I can't say, Pseudocris nigrida and Pseudocris feriarum. So these two species of frogs, they're closely related. They look very similar to each other. Um, but we know that they are separate species. However, their ranges overlap. And that's what this picture is showing us, right? Green is showing us Feriarum's range. Blue is showing us Negrita's range. And then that dark green shows us the overlap of the range, right? And we were looking on Monday at the calls because we know calls are important for this species. We know that males croak specific calls and that um, attracts females. And so scientists think, well, this is probably important in terms of mate choice within a species. And so those are often the same signals that we're gonna look at if we wanna understand mate choice, like 
species recognition line, right? Like is the signal that the females are using to choose males within her species, she's probably using those same signals to differentiate between males of her species and males of a different species, right? So that's, usually, that's why they were sort of looking at this because usually we find it makes sense that that signal, whatever, whatever she's using for mate choice is what's used for species recognition as well. And so that's why we looked at these oscillograms, these little, these little things that show us like the frequency and the amplitude of the calls that are being made. And you can kind of see, like I said, I'm not an expert on, on visualizing calls, but I can look at these and I can see, okay, there's definitely species differences here, right? If we look at Negrita versus Fer Ferrierum, um, we see that there's definitely a different pattern to their call. And um, one of the attributes of the call that the scientists get really excited about is the pulse rate, the pulse rate. So how quickly the croaks are coming, right? Like where you see those big spikes and you can see differences in the pulse rates across the range of these frogs. So that's what this middle part of this graph is showing us. I can point to it in both places here. Okay, the middle part of this graph, graphic, middle part here, right, is showing us the pulse rate. So that's what's down at the bottom on our x-axis here. Pulse rate from, you know, slow pulse rate to faster pulse rate, slow to fast. When we're looking at the two different species in the different areas, so see how they sort of like mapped it like in the same sort of pattern as what's on the map. So the black circles are the Ferriarum. The open circles are the Negrita. And we can see right away, right? Look at Negrita. It's got a slower pulse rate, right? Lower pulse rate. You can kind of see that in the oscillogram too. Right, see how they're like spaced apart more? That's a slower pulse rate. So they do, no matter where they're found in their range, they are at like the low end of the, the pulse rate. Uh, Theriarum, if we look to like their northernmost part of their range, way up top here, up top over here, here, there we go. You can see that the pulse rate is just slightly higher than what we would see in Negrita. Do y'all see that? See how it's like, it's like 14-ish, which is just a little bit higher than, you know, the six to 12 range that we see in the Negrita. Okay, does everyone see that or is it just me? Okay, good, okay, I see everybody nodding. Yeah, we're nodding, cool. Okay, but now look, look at these black dots. These black dots all represent different populations as we move south through the United States, right? So as we move south and we're getting closer to the range of the sister species, right, of Negrita, we see that Theriarum increases the pulse rate. See, it goes from like about 14, 16, all the way up to like 34. This is what I was talking about last time about character displacement. Normally, these two species, they'd have slightly different croaks. They're different. They're different than each other, but they're not extremely different than each other. That's what we see comparing the allopatric populations, the ones that don't live near each other, right? the ferriarum that live far away. They're allopatric compared to the populations down here near the bottom. So we see those allopatric populations are pretty similar to each other. But when we compare sympatric populations, they actually are quite different than each other, right? They have this displaced character and we think that this is a way, this makes sense, right? This is a way that females could be differentiating between the males of the different species. So of course, what are we gonna do? We're gonna be great behavioral ecologists, aren't we? And we're gonna do another study 
we're gonna we're gonna do some matroid stuff and we're gonna see if that's true. We're gonna see how important this call is. And so this again is is described in your textbook without my awesome dichotomous choice tank, because you know how much I love my dichotomous choices. Right? I brought this up like what week one, and I'm like, don't forget a dichotomous choice. Uh, <laughs> these are classic methods that are used all the time when we're looking at social behavior. We want to know if we put an animal in the middle, what does he or she prefer given two choices, right? A dichotomous choice, given two choices, which of those things do you prefer? In these tests, there's a whole bunch of tests here. In this figure on the right side, on the right side is actually from Ryan and Wilzinski. So they did a cool job of trying to show us the test that they did. I like the style of, of graph that they showed us because we've got like three different um, behavioral assays on this uh, figure all together. So kind of interesting little triangle. But they are all, there are three separate things that happen. So I wanted to make that clear, which is why I put up this little figure of the dichotomous choice test. Because what they did was they did three different types of trials where in the middle of the tank, they had a Ferraria, for, fairy, why can't I say Ferrierum? You know, isn't it nice when teachers can't say things, right? Doesn't that just like, that, that makes you feel more confident in yourself, right? That's why I do it. Um, Ferrierum, Ferrierum. Anyway, Ferrierum female is in the middle. Okay, that's my picture there. Ferrierum female is in the middle. And she's given the choice between two calls. So these are just playbacks. There's not actually like males in there. They're just the calls. They just wanna know, is this female? Are these different females, right? Are they, which are they gonna prefer? The call of Ferrierum or the call of Negrita? But like I said, they do three separate trials and that's what's up here. So if we look at A, if you look at a, 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 a over here, right? You can imagine the females in the middle and she's given a choice between the Negrita call and the call of Ferriarum that is sympatric to Negrita, okay? So if we think about the last graph, we know that this one has a higher pulse rate. This one has a higher pulse rate. So that's what A is. A is a comparison of Negrita to sympatric Ferrierum. That's what we see here. B, B over there, you see it. B is a comparison of Negrita and allopatric Ferrierum. So the Ferrierum males that live further away, remember their call had a slower pulse rate which was actually kind of more similar to Negrita, right? Different, but a little more similar. Okay, and then the last, the last of the three was C, sympatric ferriarum versus allopatric ferriarum. Yeah, they did them all. But I like this graph. We can sort of visually compare the results from all three of these. Okay, did that part make sense so far? We got three different, yeah. We got this female in the middle and she's given a choice of two things, three different ways. <laughs> I know you're like, why don't you just give her all three at once? Because that's that's really hard stats to do, right? We try, we try to control for as much as we can. And so giving her a choice of just two at a time, we can see her preferences better. She prefers this over that. She prefers this over the other, right? So that's what they're trying to do here. One more thing, well, let's make it a little more complicated. The female in the middle, ferriarum, sometimes that female is an allopatric female, and sometimes that female is a sympatric female, meaning like sometimes she's kind of like the northern frog that doesn't normally live near Negrita, and sometimes she's sympatric to Negrita. So she's like that Southern frog who's in like the dark overlappy hybrid zone area. Okay, we got this, right? 
So essentially there's six different tests. That's why there's six different dots on here. Look at that. The blue dots are allopatric. The red dots are sympatric. And we see some clear preferences. So Ryan and Wolzinski tried to, to indicate the preferences for us. Okay. In all cases, look how easy this one is to figure out. When given the choice between Negrita and either Ferriarum, see how the dots are closer to Ferriarum? The blue and the red dots are closer to Ferriarum because those females always preferred the Ferriarum call. Okay, this is great, right? Is this what we would have predicted? Yeah, she's Ferriarum herself. And she has a preference between Negrita and any type of fairy arum call. She's going towards the fairy arum call. Right? Right. Okay. So now the question is okay, what if there are two fairy arum calls, one that is sympatric, one that's allopatric? So basically, one that is very different. The sympatric one is very different than Negrita, right? The allopatric call is kind of different than Negrita. In this case, look again, see how the dots are closer to sympatric? That's telling us that, okay, they preferred the call that was more different, more different than Negrita. Even when given the choice between two ferriarum calls, the females preferred the more different one, the sympatric one. Okay, I know there's such good stuff here. And then, but wait, there's more. Right? Now we look at the red versus the blue dots. What do you notice? Let me, let me stop talking for a second now that we've sort of explained this chart. We've explained this beautiful chart here. What do you notice? What's different between the red sympatric females and the blue allopatric females. Cat wants to get in on this. The, the numbers on like, there's a bigger difference. Like, there's a bigger difference. Like, the the N? Yeah, the N is, oh okay. Am I looking at the same thing? Am I... Oh, oh, okay. So, well, I don't know, because you're looking at two different things, I think. Oh. Right? Okay. Like the N is just the sample size. Oh, okay. How many there are. But you said the 0.87. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then don't compare that to the 49. It's like compared to 0.67, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just maybe misunderstanding what you're saying. But you're saying there's a difference in yes good okay good yes so the ends we can not that we can ignore those they just showed us the sample sizes but yes the red ones if we look at the point number which is showing us some sort of preference scale basically right cat points out they're always higher right they're always higher than the blue ones 0 0.87 0 0.81 0 0.88 as opposed to 0 0.61, 0 0.67, and 0.63, the numbers that are on like the outside of the triangle, right? The inside numbers are just like how many they did, which is good. They're just showing us like, hey, we tested a lot of frogs, which is good because they should tell they should test a lot of frogs. But right, looking at those numbers, the red ones are higher. So what does what do you think that means? What do we think that means? Anyone at home can jump in too, but we'll let Vivian. Right, so the sympatric frogs show a stronger preference than the allopatric frogs do. Huh, huh, that's what good scientists say. Huh, that kind of makes sense though, right? Would I predict that? Yeah, right, would we predict that? The sympatric ones, remember, are the ones that normally hang out with other negritas, with other species. Right? 
And so it's possible, look at us reaching here, trying to understand the why, why this is, right? It's possible that from like a mechanistic sensory standpoint, these females are like more attuned to that difference, right? They are, their sensory systems make them more aware of the difference between the two, which could be why they're showing this stronger preference. Not to say that the allopatric frogs didn't show the preference, they did, right? We see that. We see that they show a preference for their own species. But it seems that that is stronger and that also is usually co-evolving with the character displacement, right? We see the character displacement on the male side of this scenario, but we will also see usually some sort of corresponding response in the female or else there's really no point to the male, right? Difference if there's no like female um, side of that, right? Where the females are actually responding to that difference in the species. Um, and so this is something that we're looking at in a lot of different types of animals in a lot of different situations, but we often do look at sort of these hybrid zone scenarios where two closely related species have some sort of overlap. And we start to look to see like, well, what is the mechanism? What is going to be used for species recognition when we, when we compare between the two? All right, so this is frogs. Uh, I wanna spend the rest of the class talking about a, a bird a bird study that's being done that's very similar to this. But anyone have questions on this or what it means or, or any of that? Like I said, this is described in your book. You didn't do a horrible job of going through it all. So you can always go back and look in there. It's in the beginning of chapter seven. Um, and I'm happy to share the original papers with you too, because I actually shared, I don't know if anybody checked out D2L today, but I share, I just posted some papers um, about the next example that I wanna talk about. So these papers that I posted are like the original papers that I'm talking about today. Uh, they're not like required reading because I'm, I'm talking about them, right? But I always like to go back, science nerds, right? I like to go back and really like read over the study and find out what the scientists did and that kind of stuff. So I posted uh, two papers actually uh, from Amber Rice's lab, Amber Rice, she's, she's actually a friend of mine, so I should preface with that. I mean, like kind of friends, we're like kind of friends, like we've hung out a couple of times. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say like we're best friends, because that's weird. But I'm kind of best friends with her husband, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so, but in a good way, like I just saw laughing, but like we just, we, we did our PhD, so anyway. She's wonderful. She's the way more brilliant one in that pair. And... Um, and I'm friends with the dumb husband. Um, she's wonderful. And I, why do I bring her up? And why do I tell you about how wonderful she is? I'm just throwing it out there that if anybody's looking for a PhD, I went to Lehigh University. That's where I got my PhD. She started working there after I graduated. Um, and she's always looking for students and postdocs. So if you find this at all interesting, I'm just tossing that idea out there. Pennsylvania's not that far away if you're looking for a postdoc. And, Wait till you hear about what she's doing and you'll be all about it. You'll be so excited about it. I love her work so much. Um, so let me, let me tell you about it. So she studies the black cap chickadee and the Carolina chickadee. And these, first of all, are two of my favorite species of birds. I am not a birder, but I love me some black cap chickadee. You've, you've seen them around here, right? And have you fed them? Have you put the, you put the food in your hands? And then they come and they land in your hands. I see the girl at home, they're like, no. I'm like, yes. I do this all the time because I like to pretend I'm Snow White. And I'm like, oh, and then the birds come and eat on my hands. And then I'm like, do the laundry, but they don't. Anyway, so I've, I've always been obsessed with black cap chickadees because they're just so cool. And they will eat out of my hand. We've trained them here in Buffalo to eat out of our hands. Um, this has been going on for many, many years. If you go to like Tiff Nature Preserve, they're, they will like attack you for food, right? They're all about it. Um, but enough about that. Let's talk about them generally speaking. You can see the black cap chickadee range in this map here. It's the blue area, right? The bluish purple area. That's where the black cap chickadees are. And of course, where are we? 
we're like right here, right? We're right there. So we don't really have Carolina chickadees here. I mean, maybe one or two will, will show up. This is a whole other part of the story that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but the Carolina chickadee range is actually expanding north. Global climate change, right? So it's expanding north. Um, so we will occasionally see uh, Carolina here. But the yellow line is kind of showing us the extent of the Carolina chickadees range, which is it, it actually cuts through Pennsylvania. And then it dips down because Appalachian Mountains, you know, and then like up through Ohio there. So they're not too far away from us. We can drive just a couple hours and we'd be able to see the chickadees, uh, the Carolina chickadees. But like I said, that, that range is ever shifting thanks to global climate change. What's kind of interesting though, and this is a reason that they've been studied by Amber Rice and others, is that there is this very small zone where they overlap, but that's it. They don't extend their ranges sort of past that hybrid zone. It's like you get to that line and you find both of them and it's really only 10, 20 miles wide. And then south of that are the Carolina chickadees and north of that are the black cap chickadees. So that in itself is a very interesting demarcation between them. It's a small hybrid zone where we will find hybrids between the two species. It's a stable hybrid zone. It doesn't really get bigger or smaller. Um, and even though it moves a little bit, it really is pretty stable in its size. Right, it's pretty stable in its size. Um, so they're, they're sort of interesting to look at for a variety of reasons. But of course, what I wanna talk about today is, you know, Amber and her students are looking into the hybrids that these two species produce and different aspects of why they remain separate species, right? Like why aren't they completely hybridizing why do we see this very small zone? Um, I also just want to point out, in case you're not a birder, right? And we'll come back to this. I want to point out what they look like. Most folks can't really tell the difference between them, right? Me included. <laughs> I would not be able to tell. Uh, they look very, very similar to each other. Genetically, they're pretty similar to each other. Um, and, you know, just visually, they only really differ in some coloration on their sides, right, on their wings. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. Like, how are they staying separate? How, why aren't they intergressing with each other? Why aren't they interbreeding? Um, so let me tell you about some of the studies that they've done to explore more about this. Why aren't they intergressing? Why aren't they becoming one species? Why, why is that range so small? Okay, so the first important point of this is there is a cost to hybridizing. Basically, hybrids, the birds that are the result of a Carolina and a black cap chickadee having offspring together, they don't do as well. From a fitness perspective, here's our evolutionary fitness that we have to take into consideration. This graph is showing us the hatching success. So do the eggs hatch? If two birds lay some eggs together, what percentage of eggs are actually gonna hatch and produce viable offspring? They figure this out by obviously just, if, if we look up the Y axis, we're just, y-axis, we're just looking at what percentage. So the top would be 100% of the eggs that are in there. So if they laid four eggs and four of them hatched and made four successful birds, right, that would be 1.0 or 100%. If they laid four eggs and only two of them hatched, right, it'd be at 0.5, it'd be 50%, okay? So that's hatch, hatch success. The x-axis here on the bottom, it sounds different than what it is. It's, it says it's a pair compatibility index. You guys see that? So I want you to write down what it actually means. It means when they look at the male and the female that lay the eggs in the nest, they take a blood sample and they run some genetics 
And they basically look to see like how much of one species are you? Because there are some hybrids that exist, right? So looking at the genetics, they can say, oh, this bird, you know, this dad bird is like 75% black cap chickadee, 25% Carolina chickadee, right? Like it's a second generation hybrid type thing because maybe they were like a 50-50 hybrid and then that one reproduced with somebody who was a pure, is this making sense? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so there's degrees. There's degrees of hybrids. I, it's so weird. It's so weird. I was describing this to my husband the other day and because he loves this stuff too. And, and I was like, he's like, oh, so they, you know, the black caps and the Carolinas mate with each other. I was like, yeah, but then the hybrids, they mate with black caps or they mate with Carolinas or they mate with other hybrids, right? So there's this like continuum of chickadee that goes from like black cap to Carolina. And there's everybody in between also. Okay, so, if we, so we understand that part, right? Because we're almost at what this pair compatibility means now. Pair compatibility is how alike are two birds. So if two black cap chickadees reproduce, they would be at one, right? They would be on the far right side. If we have two pure black cap chickadees, they would be at one. If we have two pure Carolina chickadees, they would also be at one, right? They would also be at one. So this just means like pure species. If we look on the far right side, those are male and females that are pure of their species that are reproducing together. And then as you sort of go down to zero, it's like, how different are they? A black cap chickadee that's pure and a Carolina chickadee that's pure that reproduce together, they'd be at zero. Yes. They'd be right in the middle. Yes, exactly. So if you have two that are the same, oh no, you're right. I was like, no, you're right. If they are both the same with each other, 50 50, then they themselves would be compatible. I don't think they are included in this graph, though. Because I was like, now that I'm looking at this, right? Um, because one, that is a rare matchup <laughs> that, that actually happens in real life. Um, and two, um, that produces hybrids that are point five also, but in a different way, right? And so I think that those are not included in this graph. It's just when they're different, right? Or they're the same exact species. But when they're both hybrids, yeah. They have to be like differing amounts of hybrid level. I know, right? Isn't this awesome? Pat, question. Yeah, like with yeah with a hybrid right but like i said i don't think it's like two exact hybrids meeting with each other right so the middle ones are like a pure with a hybrid pure black cap or pure carolina with a hybrid right either but what percentage of hybrid 25 percent, 50 percent, or 75 percent Right. So, so right. So this, that's why I was like, this graph is a smidge confusing because it, it just gives us a pair compatibility index. And they just want to say like how similar or how different are the birds, right? If they're the same species, they're at this side. If they're different species, they're at that side and then in the middle. But like I said, I don't think that, I don't even know if they had exactly 50-50 ones or if they just excluded them. But see, this is why I posted the real paper for us too. So we can go back through this and we can look and see. Um, but mainly, mainly they were looking at peers versus, you know, like black cap, black cap or Carolina, Carolina. And they were trying to get, I just know this in conversation, they were trying to look at the opposite where you'd have the two different species and that didn't happen very often. And you can tell 
right? It doesn't happen very often at the far side of the graph, the, the zero part of the graph. We really don't have a lot of dots there, right? We don't see where there's this like Carolina black cap reproductive opportunity. It doesn't seem to happen very often. But the hybrids in the middle will sort of back cross to one of the parents. That's why we see some in the middle themselves. Um, so what did, what did they find out? I know there's just lots of dots on this graph. Um, that line is sort of showing us the progression that the more similar the two species are in terms of the hybrid with the purebred, the higher the hatching success they had, right? There is a cost to mating with birds that are more different than you genetically. But though, I know I got some smart cookies out there. You're looking way over in that left-hand corner, aren't you? And you see that dot in the far left side. And you're like, but what about that one? I know this is one of those cases where they did have individuals of the different species and they had a hundred percent catch rate. So it's not, this is not like an all or nothing type thing, right? But the trend, the data, this is what we look at in science. Data tells us that overall, when we have lots and lots of samples, if you mate with a bird that is more similar to you genetically, you have a higher hatch rate, generally speaking. Well, I, I guess I don't wanna say more similar necessarily. So they were only looking at genes that are um, unique to each of the two species. So there are specific marker genes, right? So this is a handful. I forget if it's like five to 10 genes, maybe. Maybe it's 13. The species I work on, we use 10. We use 10 genes to tell the difference between two species. But though those genes, um, just looking at those 10 genes doesn't tell us like how different the two individuals are like in their whole genome. You know what I mean? Like they don't have it. But yes, I see what your point is, what you're getting at, right? Like if we are um, like two brothers, or two brothers, a brother and sister, two siblings, two brothers, that one, a brother and sister, right? Who are reproducing, who share 50% of their genetics, right? Then we know that there can be some overlap in that. Um, but that's not the level of genetics they were looking at. So they were just really looking at genes that are specifically different between the two. So it doesn't really tell us relatedness on the finer scale, but you make such a good point because, because from an evolution standpoint, we often look at hybridization, what we call introgression, as a way to bring new genes into a population. From a conservation standpoint, my conservationists out there, we often try to stop this from happening because we try to keep our species pure so that we can conserve them. But this may, this may not be what would have occurred naturally, right? Like naturally we do see some species overlap, which is why they didn't all die, right? Which is why we didn't, which is why like sometimes 100% of the offspring hatch because obviously genetically they are somewhat compatible. But it just seems that, you know, based on the idea of these reproductive isolating mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, that often two different species, when they reproduce, they suffer from some sort of reduction in either hatching or their abilities. So let me tell you the next part of the story, because maybe that'll, that'll start to make a little more sense to you too. Like why hybridizing is not, even though it could bring in new genes, right? It could lead to new genetic mixes. It's not always the best. Here we're seeing hybridization often reduces hatching success, but perhaps more importantly, hybrid offspring also are deficient in learning and memory. This is so great. This, see, see how I'm getting so excited about the story? Get this. Get this. Okay. Think, first, think about these birds. They are birds that do um, winter caching. You know how birds cache? Have we talked about this in other classes? 
these birds, like all summer long, they hide food, like thousands of bits of food. And then they have to remember where that food is hidden so that they can eat over the winter so they don't starve to death, right? And they hide them in all different spots. It's not like they have like one mountain of food. They hide them in all these different spots. So we've studied, we, other people, have studied this like um, spatial and learning ability of chickadees to be able to understand like how they remember where they hit all their food and how they find it all the time, right? And so based on this, we would expect that they would be like super smart. They'd remember where things are and they'd be very quick at learning because they're gonna have to remember where they put stuff. So some other students, Mike McQuillan, who worked in Amber Rice's lab, for his PhD, he did this really interesting study. It was two parts. So I put up some pictures here so we could look at the two different parts. It was all about how the hybrids were doing in terms of how they learned and remembered things. So if we look at the picture that's on the left here, okay, what this is showing us is they had this setup that was these six blocks, so 60 different little um, pouches. On each of those blocks are 10 pouches. They're like little leather pockets. They're so cute. They're like these tiny little pockets. And inside the pocket, the researchers could hide some food. And so they would take like mealworms, which are like extra juicy and delicious and wonderful, right? Birds love them. And they could hide them in these pockets. And then what they would do, do you see the little white dots that are on the pockets? The little, we're very scientific. The little white dots are like those little crafty pom-pom things. You know, you know what I mean? Does anyone else have a five-year-old daughter at home who does like crafts? <laughs> you use these when you were like in Girl Scouts. I don't think Boy Scouts probably do this sort of crafting, do they? We're very sexist in our country. Um, but those little pom pom -y like things that you can buy at a craft store, right? We glue them together and make snowmen. But they took all these like white little pom-poms and they would stick them on top of the pockets. And so the birds would have to go in and they would pull off the, it's so cute. I watched them do this. They would pull off the pom-poms and then they'd stick their head in there to look for the mealworms. Okay, so we got that. We're like, this is silly. I know, but the birds had to learn and remember where the food was. So the researcher for each bird would put the worm in one of the 60 pockets, the same pocket every time different pockets for different birds. But the bird always had the worm in the same pocket. And then they wanted to measure the learning and memory of that bird. Could they learn to pick all the little pom-poms off and search in there? And could they remember which pocket it was in? Okay, so that's a cool study, right? Anyone at home have questions on that? Are we feeling good? That's fun, I love it. I love putting birds to work. Okay, the other, the other, you can see this chickadee here, he's so cute. The other test they did was that like a novel, you know, something new, a new sort of learning situation where inside that, see that little white circle? It's like a little cup. And on the inside of it is a piece of food. On top is like a little cap, they call it a washer. It's like a little cap and it has a little window on it. So the bird can see inside there and see that there's a little worm inside, but he's going to have to take that cap off or push it over. It's not like a screw cap. It's not, we're not that mean, right? We're not like unscrew, no. They just had to like move it over in order to get inside. So they, but they had to figure that out, right? That was like a novel learning situation. So these two tests, are done on a whole bunch of the different birds, right? Ones that are the black capped chickadees, ones that are the Carolina chickadees, and then ones that are hybrid, ones that are hybrid. And we wanna know who's doing better, right? Who can remember where the food is and who can learn to take the cap off to get the food. This, I love this so much, love it. Okay, let's look at some data. Okay, so here is the memory one first, the little pockets with the pom-poms on top. We've got 
the day, testing days. So this was a test that was done over multiple days, right? That's what's on our x-axis. And then we've got the score, which is basically like how many mistakes are made? Like how many times does the bird go into the wrong pocket before it gets to the right pocket, right? So technically it could go to like 59 wrong pockets before it finds the food. It doesn't obviously, but it could, it could. It could go to 59 wrong pockets. And then you would expect, I know you've taken lots of classes about learning. You would expect that they would get better over time, right? So this is over seven days. And we're looking at the three groups here. The gray are the black cab chickadees, the black are the Carolina chickadees, and the red are the hybrids between them. And you can see this, right? Who sucked the worst? Who, who was the worst at this? I use all the scientific terms. Who sucked the worst? The hybrid sucked the worst, right? Everybody at home was saying hybrid and then their roommates were like, what are they talking about? Hybrid. Yeah, the hybrids, right? They were not as good. They were, the red line is clearly on the top, right? It's clearly on the top. They made more mistakes. They did not remember. They did, I mean, they did sometimes. It's not like they couldn't find, they're not like, oh, where's the food, right? And they learn and you can see that same sort of learning curve as we go throughout. But the hybrids were definitely not as good as either the black caps or the Carolina chickadees, especially if we consider the entire range of this test. Pretty interesting, right? All right, questions on that? We can break it down even. They broke it down by sex also. I told you we're always interested in stuff. And when we're looking at all aspects of social behavior, sex differences, are there sex, isn't that what you're just dying? No, are there sex differences? All right, so they broke it down for us. Uh, the open symbols are the males. The closed symbols are the females. And the same colors are there. The black cap chickadees are gray, the Carolina, are the black symbols and then the hybrids are the red symbols. Okay, so let me ask you the same question. Are you ready folks at home? Who sucked the most? Who was the worst at this? Huh? The hybrid females sucked the most, huh? Like real bad. <laughs> That's interesting to think about. Everyone see that at home too? You see that? See how that red line is so much higher. So the females seem to be worse at remembering where these are. And this is especially true for the hybrids, right? This is especially true for the hybrids. This is only kind of maybe true for the pure Carolinas and the pure blacks. It's not really, you don't really see that effect there. Crazy, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. If we look at the sample size, the N, it does, we do see a lot more males than females. So does that matter? Sure. It is a big gap. So did everyone at home hear that? Like Elena saying like, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so if we look at the sample size, right? We were talking about how N means the sample size. And yeah, in each of the groups, there's more males than females that were tested. And also we know for behavioral studies, these are pretty small numbers, right? These are pretty small numbers just generally speaking. Um, I agree that they should definitely, they don't have to be the same though. I do wanna point that out. They don't necessarily have to be the same number, but if we could increase the sample size for all of them, that would be great. And especially for the females. Um, that being said, they so they run statistics, right? They run statistics that is supposed to be able those mathematical tests are supposed to be able to account for those differences in sample sizes. 
right? Like that the males and females are different, that all the groups have different numbers of birds in them. And those big bars that are around the dots, notice how they're biggest for the female hybrids too, right? Like, especially if we look at day six, that means there was a big difference between the, let's see what do we have, three, the three females. That means there was a lot of variation in those three females, right? So the mathematical model is trying to account for the fact that the sample sizes are so small. Um, but yeah, that could definitely be an issue with this. With this. And they, they discussed that a little bit in the paper. The bigger problem is like finding a lot of animals to test these in. So the birds that they use are ones that they actually catch in the field, right? So these are not lab raised birds. These are ones that they've caught um, at a national park that's nearby. Um, so finding, and especially finding hybrids was always difficult for them to, to do. And then they'd re-release the birds afterwards. So they try not to have too big a sample sizes. But yeah, that could definitely be an issue. That could definitely be an issue. Um, but the ranges, the, the, those bars show us something that there's no overlap there, right? Those females are clearly a standard deviation away from everybody else. But yeah, I'm totally gonna bring this up the next time I have drinks with Amber. I'm gonna be like, listen, we were talking about your graphing class. And Lena was like, hey, uh, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Uh, Dr. McQuillan, who worked on this as a PhD student has moved on to some other things, but it'd be interesting to look at this deeper. Um, but looking back at the other, the other slide, right? Here when we, we have our sample sizes of like 10 and 11, I'm a little more confident in those data, right? But I agree with you, those sex differences, there's something there maybe, um, but it would be nice to reinforce that with a little bit more data. Good, good catch. All right, other questions or observations, thoughts on this? Definitely interesting. So this was my, my point too of like, well, we have to consider not just hatch rate, but we should consider other aspects of their behavior. It seems like memory, Hybrids aren't that great at remembering. Okay, how about problem solving? How, how good are they at problem solving when they have that little container that has the bird, the, not the bird, the food in it, the little worm in it? How good are they at doing it? How good are they at like getting it open and figuring it out? So these graphs, these are pretty simple graphs to look at. And again, they are small sample sizes. Are the sample sizes on here? Yeah, near the bottom. Somewhat small sample sizes, especially for the Carolinas that they, they tested. Um, and so then they combine them together. So A is the two species separately, the Carolina and the black cap versus the hybrid. And then B is showing us the same data, but they put the pure species together for their analysis. Um, and in both of these cases, Right, it seems that most of the time, the black capped and the Carolina, almost 100% of the time, those pure species were able to do that novel test and get the food out right away. But only about 60% of the time were the hybrids able to do that. And so when you compare the pure species versus the hybrid that we see in chart B here, we see that there is a difference, right? The hybrids are not as great at doing it. All right, so what did we find out so far? Hybrids are not so great, right? They're not as great at memory. They're not as great at learning how to do a task. And the hatch success for hybrids that breed are kind of low. So this tells us, right, these two species probably should avoid reproduction. So even though like we talked about, right, bringing in extra genes might be beneficial in some way, it seems that the hybrids have some sort of reduced fitness to them. How, did you hear that question? How is it possible that the hybrids are worse? We have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea, right? They're both good. Like if there's two small parents, how do they have a short kid, right? We don't know, right? We know that understanding the control mechanism of memory and learning is very complex, 
right? It's a very complex mechanistic neuron hormone thing. And it just seems that whatever mix comes together with the two species, there's this reduced hybrid performance, which is actually something we see again and again when we test them. This is not unique, right? This is not like a unique finding, like the hybrids aren't as good as the pure species. We've seen this. We don't fully understand why. We don't know why it is that these hybrids have a reduced ability, but they do, but they do, yeah. So this is definitely an area where we're still trying to figure stuff out. And to give, to give the rice lab credit, they're still trying to figure out a lot of stuff, right? So the, the next paper I think just came out in 2019, the one that we're gonna talk about next. Um, so they're still digging deeper, trying to figure out like what is it that's making these hybrids less good, right? Than the parental species. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So right from a con conservation standpoint. So that's not really an issue here, right? Like neither of these is endangered at the moment. Um, so so there's not a lot of this is not a conservation effort. Yeah, Claire's saying like the genes just didn't make sure. Um, yeah, often this is usually like if we have that sort of introgression plan as part of our species recovery plan. Yeah, it's usually like, what else are we gonna do, right? Because again and again, we find that those genes, when they come together, we don't fully understand it, but they're not, the hybrids very often do not perform as well as, as the parental species do on all aspects of it, on all levels. Like we said, hatching, memory, learning, and memory and learning is so important in this species. They gotta find their food. They gotta find their food. All right, Elena, question. Everyone at home, if you have questions, you can jump in too. Are they like, are the parents like, are they caring for the offspring differently? Is that what you're saying? Well, like, I mean, both have yeah. Yes. Right. So this is a good point. And this is a lot of our hypotheses about many of the types of traits that hybrids often fail at, right? That they're, they're worse at. It's because like the mix is not as good as each individual for their separate ranges. So that was a question. Like they come from separate ranges. So maybe one is well adapted to this range and one is well adapted to that range. And when you have a mix, a hybrid of the two, they're not adapted well to either range. But in this case, they both should be able to hide their food, right? This is Magdalena's point. Like they should both be able to hide their food and find their food well, because that's something they both do. So that's what makes it like a, a little extra confusing. Like why it's this trait is, is somewhat suppressed in them. But yes, totally. Like totally when we see reduced hybrid viability or reduced hybrid performance, it usually has something to do with the fact that they're in different ranges. In this case, we're still, we're, I don't know. See, this is why I said, if any of you wanna get a PhD, this, I'm telling you, go look, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff we still need to figure out about these chickadees. So much stuff. All right, so let me tell you about this part. Let me tell you about this part of it. And then we'll come up with more questions to send to Dr. Rice. Um, and I'm gonna send you all to her to work with her. All right, so this gives us some evidence though that like, Carolina and black cap chickadees should be able to recognize each other and only mate with their own species, right? Because the hybrids aren't as good as the pure offspring. So then we start asking this like other branch of questions, right? Which is how, how is it that they recognize each other? What are they using? Are they using calls? Are they using coloration? I don't think it's coloration because I can't tell the difference between them. We don't think it's calls. And I don't have a ton of time to go into all of this, 
But the studies on the chickadees show that chickadees can, they are one of the bird types, types of songbirds that learn their song, right? So when we look at songbirds, some songs are like super innate, like they're born knowing that song and then they tweak that song. Chickadees can learn a whole new song and they learn it from their parents, okay? So we don't think that song is going to be the best species recognition modality because whatever bird you're raised with, you're gonna sing those songs. And so they would be the same. Okay, so that's very unsatisfying, but like I said, we don't think it's that, we don't think it's coloration. So then it's the rice lab was like, well, what is it? What could it be then? And they're like, we've got an idea. Let's talk about the preening gland, the uropygial gland. Any of my birders ever heard of the uropygial gland? Sometimes it's called the preening gland, sometimes it's called an oil gland. Yeah, we're looking at bird butts right here. Do you see this? Yeah. Jen at home is like, yeah, absolutely. If you look on this blue right here, you can kind of see this little like bump that is, it, it, the lighting in here is bad. Maybe at home, if you look on this, there's like a little bump under those rump feathers before the tail feathers come out. It's right on the body. You can kind of see it here too. This is an oil gland that most birds have and they produce this uropygial oil that when, you know, when the birds are preening, right? And they're doing it, I can't do it very well, right? But they do that thing and then they like rub their beak all over themselves. And you're like, oh, they're cleaning themselves. They're usually rubbing oil on their feathers, right? So that they're getting this oil from their, from their butt gland, weird. Uh, and then they rub it all over themselves. And this is good, this helps to keep them drier because the oil, you know, kind of makes it so that the, the water doesn't get their feathers wet. Um, let's see what I say. Is there any different ranges in life? Why do humans not reproductively isolate? Hmm. Can I save that for next week's lesson? That question? Okay. <laughs> I was like, because I have so much I could say about it. We don't reproductively isolate. The question was like, why aren't humans isolating like each other? We don't, we're a mix, but we'll come back to that. Good question. Um, okay, so this uropygial gland, right, is sort of a candidate. We think like, okay, maybe the oils are the way that the birds can tell the difference between each other. And this is not that surprising because other species use olfactory modalities to tell the difference between each other very often. So the folks in the rice lab, they collect the oil from the gland of the black cap chickadees and the Carolina chickadees. And they do, here's my fancy science setup. They are able to basically extract the different components that make up the oil. So if we think about all the different chemicals that make up oil, um, there are just like different components to it, right? Different types of lipids, different aerosols that are in there. And they use this um, gas spectrometer, right? Which basically means they take each component of the oil and they sort of like turn it into a gas. And then the machine tells us exactly what the composition of that is. So this is our GT mass spec. And they're able to really like identify all the different pieces of it. So that's interesting, right? Cause we can compare between species, like chemically are your oils the same or are they different? Which would tell us something about if this cue could be used to identify species. And then the second part of this is like, hey, let's do some behavior, of course. Let's talk about some behavior. So they use this Y maze. Can you see this down here? This Y maze where they take the birds who have the oil all over them, but they, the, they're blocked off. So you can't really see them. You can't see the birds, but the air is blowing over the birds in this Y maze. So you have like a black capped chickadee on one side and a Carolina chickadee on the other. And we're just like blowing air over them. 
and it goes down the arms of the Y maze. And then at the bottom of the Y down here, the bottom of, let me see it at home. The bottom of the Y way down here, you put a bird and then you look to see which way they go, which, which this is another dichotomous choice test, all about the dichotomous choice test. But now it's just a slightly different setup, right? Because it's not a visual choice. Instead of it's an olfactory choice that they're making. So the, the setup is slightly different. Um, but they're trying to see if these oils are giving off a scent that the chickadees can use to determine which, you know, which species that they're going to mate with, right? Okay, so let's look at the data in our last few minutes of class. I said we'd get out early, but I lied. I always lie. Because I get so excited about chickadees and everything and everything. Okay, so here's some good stuff to start. Looking at the Europigia oils, we see sex differences and species differences. All right, so on the bottom, we got sexes, females and males. The different lines are the different species. We're not looking at hybrids here. We're just looking at pure species now, right? So we got the Carolina are, is the dark line and the black capped is the dotted line. And on our y-axis, this is, one aspect of the oils. So this is looking at ester versus non-ester compounds. So just different components of organic compounds. These are like different groups. And I put this up there, not so that you're like, ugh, chemistry, but instead so you're like, oh, they're different, right? They're different. It's clear that the black cap have a different ratio than the Carolina, right? That's why the two lines are separate from each other. And it looks like the males and females are different too, especially in the black cap chickadees. So that's kind of an interesting, I don't think they expected that, but it seems that the males and the females are different. That's why it's like not a straight line across. That's why it's like a diagonal line for those black caps. They have a different ratio. So males and females are different and the species are different. Cool. Cool, I know that's about as excited as I can get about chemistry. Also cool, here's some more cool chemistry. If we look at different times of year, what? different times of year, there are different components in this oil. During the breeding season, this is looking at principal component analysis. So this is just like, kind of like the makeup of it all together. The makeup of the oil is different during the breeding season compared to fall, winter, or spring, winter. Right? Fall, that's kind of a weird thing, right? But late fall, early spring as compared to their breeding season, which is like early summer. That's cool. And look at the species difference. Look at the species difference here. If we look in the breeding season, see how there's a bigger gap? If we look at the breeding season, there's a big gap between the species. But if we look during the non-breeding season, there's not a big gap. You can't see my face, but I'm going like, ah, oh, this is so cool. Look at this difference in seasonality. And it's, it's with the breeding season, right? So look at this, these are like flashing lights. Like, hey, there's species differences and there's seasonality differences. This is like a likely candidate to be a signal for species recognition, then, right? This is something that they could be using. So let's do the behavioral test and look at this. These graphs are so beautiful. If I made up data, they would not look this beautiful. <laughs> so these graphs are showing us the results of the Y maze study, where in either arm of the Y maze is either a black cap or a Carolina bird chickadee, right? And then at the bottom is one of the other species, or is one of the species. Okay, so on the top graph, the top graph here, we're looking at males. Yes, they looked at male mate choice in here too. That's a whole thing we could talk about. The bottom graph is the females, right? The bottom graph are the females. And then you can see on the left side of the graph are the black cap chickadees and on the right side of the graph are the Carolina chickadees. And wow, right? Wow. Again, I wish you could see my face. Wow. 
it's quite obvious that each species is spending more time preferring to be near the scent, not even the bird, the scent of their own species, right? You see on the left side that the bar is higher for the black cap chickadees. And on the right side, the bar is higher for the Carolina chickadee. Seriously, if I got this data and I plotted this out, I'd be crying tears of joy. This is amazing. This is amazing. Males and females, females and males, they prefer the sense of their own species. I don't know if you're all as excited as I am, but I'm gonna pretend you are. This is really exciting. So what does all this mean? Does anyone have questions on this? Because you've all had super great questions. I love it. I know you can't even have questions about this one because it's so exciting. And pretty decent sample sizes too, so I'm not too mad at them about this. Almost 20, that's pretty good for a choice study. I try to get like 20 to 25 if I'm doing a dichotomous choice test like this. And those error bars, they're pretty, they're pretty tight. They look pretty good. So pretty confident in this data. I'm biased though, because I love it. <laughs> don't love, don't marry your science. Just date it for a while, right? I'm in love with it. Um, why is this exciting? Why is this exciting? This is pointing us to the idea that black cap chickadees and Carolina chickadees are using olfactory cues. Doesn't seem that they're using visual cues. They look alike. Doesn't seem that they're using song. Like I said, song is very, can be very similar between the two of them and they can each learn each other's song. So it doesn't seem to be that. But it does seem that their Europigial oils are different than each other. And especially during the breeding season and olfaction matters when it comes to preference for who you wanna hang out with. They have a pretty developed olfactory lobe. That's what I was showing you in this figure here. So birds actually do smell stuff. They can, they can smell, they have a pretty advanced olfactory bulb. Um, other species use olfaction all the time when it comes to species recognition. Insects, fish, amphibians, mammals, we have evidence in all of these groups, though not much evidence for this in birds. And what's kind of interesting is something we talked about the other day with communication. This could be an honest signal, right? So we talked about like the signaler is always trying to like outsmart the receiver. And sometimes that's easy to do when we're talking about, you know, physiology, colors of, of feathers, song even. But this oil is, is known to be linked with circulating hormones. We know that the composition of this oil varies with age and it can vary based on diet. So we wonder if other birds are using this oil as some sort of signal too, right? Maybe not for species recognition, but maybe even for mate choice because this could tell you something about your mate that you wouldn't necessarily know just by looking at them. So the smell of them tells us something about their circulating hormones and how old they are and what they ate, which is kind of interesting. So this has actually sparked some really interesting research in the last year or so, trying to figure out how important olfaction is for bird mate choice, species recognition, or um, within a species, but we just don't know, we don't know. And this is why I'm so excited about this. This is why I went the whole class as always, because I get so excited about all these cool data points, all these interesting things that scientists are still trying to figure out. And I always love the fact that we have no idea. We have no idea, we're still trying to figure things out. People have been studying birds for ever, for hundreds of years. And this is the first one that's showing that maybe it's, it's olfaction that allows the birds to differentiate between the species. And maybe that's why we don't see that overlap, right? Maybe that's why there's like this slight hybrid zone where there's like a little bit of confusion, but these two species are actually able to very easily recognize each other. So maybe we, we won't have a lot of hybrids. If, if that makes sense. And maybe that's because of their memory and learning being so reduced. All right, who's got questions? Cause we got two minutes left. And I could talk about chickadees for another hour and a half. I just got this look from everyone at home. that was like, no, no more chickadees. We love chickadees. Let's post some chickadee videos, please. All right, um, other questions about anything? 
Can I go back to the last slide? Absolutely. Um, and these slides, did I post these slides? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Sometimes I forget, so sorry. But yeah, they should be posted. Um, other questions about the schedule for next week? I won't see you. Ooh, don't cry. I'll see you next, the next Monday, okay? I want everybody to relax this weekend. We all deserve a day or two off, please. And then get back to this like next Wednesday when I'll post us a lecture to watch, okay? All right, everybody have a super duper great break. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you for putting up with me when I get so excited about chickadees. <laughs> They're so cool. And if anyone wants to work with Dr. Rice, you let me know. I'll hook you up. All right, have a great break. Bye everybody at home, bye.